Totally Football Show. Today, Liverpool Man United. More attempts without hitting the target than apple-eating teenage Michael Owen. We discuss that game and core problems for the other Manchester side, City. Plus, the other weekend news, Chelsea's Young King Cole, Fulham's Jimenez to Society and much more in this Totally Football Show. Sunday the 17th of December. Hello. I'm here in the Totally Football Studio with Adrian Clark. Hello, Adrian. Hello. All right. We're joined by, as remote as Burnley survival hopes, Daniel Storey and Matt Davis-Adams. Hi, James. Hello, Matt Davis-Adams. Hi. Yeah, there he is. That's in a bit of a grump, listeners. <laughs> I'm not, I, this is outrageous. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled to be here and talk about a wonderful weekend of football if we stay away from Friday night, maybe. All right, then. Friday night, huh? Well, it's a weekend... Uh, with so many elements to it, one above all, our thoughts with Luton skipper Tom Lockyer, who began the weekend eagerly awaiting his side's match with, with Bournemouth and continuing the hatter-spirited battle with the drop, but he's currently recovering in hospital after collapsing 65 minutes into the game away at the Vitality Stadium with a cardiac arrest. Thankfully, Sunday, he's been described as stable. Alex Brody of The Athletic uh, joins us now for a quick update. Uh, so the latest from Luton is that he's still in hospital having tests. Um, they put the club put out a statement Sunday afternoon saying, uh, could he kind of just be left alone and wait to see what the, the test results are before any kind of decision going forward is. And obviously the thoughts of the club and everyone with, uh, with Tom and, and his family at this time. What, what does he represent to the club, Tom Lockyer? As, as with a few players in the squad, a, a good example of how the club's progressed uh, done well in the championship and then stepped up to the Premier League level as I think they have in quite a few games this season, the club as a whole. But Lockyer kind of represents that as the captain and a goal-scoring defender. Um, he's kind of come through the leagues as Luton have and he hasn't looked out of place at all at the, the highest level. Scored in Luton's first ever Premier League win. Was career very much a, a secondary question now uh, as he recovers in hospital. But Luton, who went on to win that playoff final against Coventry that he collapsed in back in, in the summer, no question of them continuing this game here. How, how do you feel, feel the, the club is going to respond to this? Um, as I said, they have they kind of want to wait and see what the test results are. And I guess the interesting thing will be the decisions that are made going forward that Tom obviously has to make with his family and with medical kind of uh, advice obviously and the club will obviously just have to give him time to make that decision I guess he he returned after the collapse in the playoff final he then had tests and it was felt he was fine to return and he 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 wanted to return this I think having happened again what seven months later must be very difficult for him to make that kind of decision what he does with his career um, going forward really Alex Brody there. Well, I'm sure we're all really grateful that Tom received such immediate care and is, is now doing better. But second time this year, Daniel, you were there in the, the championship playoff game where he, he, he collapsed uh, shortly after the kickoff. Yeah, I was. And, and I think, you know, when the dust settles on this incident and, and mercifully it sounds like Tom is going to be OK in his health. We don't know about his professional career yet, but that clearly comes second. There probably will be an examination of... Um, he You know, he was he was cleared to play uh, after that initial collapse. Um, I think it's probably fair to say that it would be a, a strange coincidence if, if these two incidents weren't linked and therefore that there may have to be an exa- re-examination of those, you know, how we assess players because... You know, football is not everything. A player's health is, is of paramount importance above everything else and we have to protect players in these incidents. And, yeah, I mean, obviously the main thing is that it sounds like Tom is, is going to be OK in the long run. Um, he was awake. We got a kind of report before the game had even been due to finish that he was kind of at least awake and responsive and on his way to hospital. But, yeah, once is too much for a player. So twice, I mean... Goodness only knows the fear he was going through at that moment. Yeah, and for everybody who was there on on the pitch and at the ground, Adrian, you, something similar happened in a game that you were playing in. Yeah, I've experienced this, and it it was undoubtedly the most harrowing experience of my career. It was come towards the end when I was playing non-league football. 
in 2005 and it was a Kent Cup senior um, semi-final against Folkestone. I was playing for Margate at the time and and yeah, the centre forward, Paul Sykes, was just running towards the halfway line and just hit the deck and I, I still can't get the image of his of his face, you know, out of my mind, to be honest. I, it, I, can, I can go right back there because it was something I'd, I'd never want to see or experience again. It was it was awful and we obviously all left the field and, and left the medics to, to deal with it. And unfortunately, in, in this case, Paul didn't make it and um, it, it was later discovered that he had a heart defect that, that, that they were unaware of previously. And yeah, we played the cup final and it was dedicated in his memory and and his wife and and young son were there and presented us the trophy. So it was it was it was an unforgettable experience, but not in in the right way. No, of course not. Poor chap. Uh, it it seemed totally logical this game didn't go ahead on Saturday because of what had happened. And kind of looking back, I'm wondering how is it that the championship playoff final continued? It, it was an odd incident in that um, nobody was really sure what had happened. It, he left the field reasonably quickly. Um, uh, and at the time, people wondered if he'd just kind of sort of fainted. I, I, I think it was pretty warm on the day. It, it didn't seem as, as serious as that. And, and and that sounds a really trite thing to say. But from everybody in the ground, there wasn't, you know, he, he, he got an ovation when he went off, etc. But there wasn't really a sense that something incredibly kind of life-threatening had happened at that moment. Whereas... You know, watching the footage from Saturday, it really did feel like that. I mean, partly, I think, because it was Tom Lockyer and it had already happened, but also because I think people, the way the players were reacting, there wasn't quite that sense um, at the playoff final. Um, I don't know if that's because we were all being, you know, transfixed in kind of, it's a playoff final and we're all focused on that. And that, if so, then that's, still, you know, that's, that paints us all in guilt. Um, but no, it just, it, it did feel different. I think one other key difference here is, is Rob Edwards, the manager, was clearly in no fit state to concentrate on the game. I think because he it was Tom Lockyer again and he, he knew the possible long-term ramifications for Tom as well, um, that he, yeah, he, just, he, he wouldn't have been able to continue and to focus on that game. I, I think it absolutely was the, was the right call. Excellent. Great news that he's doing better and uh, many best wishes for his recovery. Uh, let's now move on to the action Elsewhere in the Premier League, match day 17 saw Liverpool held nil-nil at Anfield by Manchester United. Prior to that, Arsenal had been 2-0 winners against Brighton. Villa also a victorious 2-1 away at Brentford. Saturday, though, Man City slipped again. A 2-2 draw for them at home to Crystal Palace. But our Spurs on Friday met Nottingham Forest. And details on that are a bit sketchy. Elsewhere... Everton had won their fourth straight game. This time it was at Burnley. Sheffield United lost 2-0 at Chelsea. Newcastle, who will be facing Chelsea in the League Cup on Tuesday, beat Fulham. Scottish is going down to 10 men after Ralph Jimenez. It was a bit rash in his challenge. And the other game which we haven't mentioned is West Ham beating Wolves 3-0. And that's your lot. Singular feature of the Sunday 2 o'clock games wasn't just that West Ham Wolves was the one on telly, but also that of the six managers involved, only two escaped a booking, De Zerbi and Moyes. My money would have been, if you'd said four of the six are going to get a card, my money would have been on Moyes, but, but no. Anyway, that probably wasn't the biggest story on Sunday, not a Sunday when we had Liverpool facing Man United at Anfield. Well, we searched high and wide for a bit of comms to big up this game. Beginning of our match report. I'm, I might have gone for the bit 20 minutes to go when Peter Drury says, oh, a football match. <laughs> uh, one that ended nil-nil, uh, much against everyone's expectations. Do you know, it's only the fourth nil-nil in the Premier League this season. We're 17 match days in. Extraordinary. What, why, why was this game nil-nil? Matt, were you able to catch much of it? I was, yeah. And, and I'm just looking and, and wondering the same because I'm seeing that Liverpool had 34 shots at goal, which seems quite extraordinary to have that number of attempts and, and not manage to score. I just wonder if if it was the overpowering narrative from yesterday of Manchester City could be 12 points behind Liverpool by the next time they play a Premier League game and uh, the footballing gods going, yeah, but maybe not because they'll draw at home to Man United and then they'll draw with Arsenal and then Manchester City will have their way back into the title race and things will pan out just as they should. But um, 
I don't know, maybe it was because Mo Salah didn't have his scoring boots on. Maybe mm. it's because Liverpool hadn't worked hard enough at corners in training this week because they had so many of them. It felt like they were duty-bound to, to produce a goal with one. Um, but yeah, I mean, Man United come out looking good, don't they? It, it sort of seemed a bit baffling to see Eric Ten Hag's pre-match interview talking about how Scott McTominay embodies everything about Manchester United and how he's an example of what it means to play for them. And you're thinking, but didn't you spend half the summer trying to sell him? And, and the script seemed to have been written for more embarrassment for the Red Devils at Anfield. But they could have won it. You know, that, that Hoyland mm. chance was probably the chance of the game. Yeah, indeed. Did you were saying, Adrian? Did Liverpool shoot too much? <laughs> Possibly. I think they were a bit rash with their their shooting. You know, trying things from tight angles, weren't they? Rather than maybe teeing up somebody for a, for a better opportunity. I think you've got to give Manchester United some rare credit here. We don't. We haven't given that out a lot this season. They've been shambolic, haven't they? And they haven't been a team. I thought they would be annihilated in this game. I did, because they're going into the cauldron of Anfield. They they are not together, or it didn't feel like they were. Uh, yet they they mustered up quite a bit of teamwork, and uh, and I thought they fought hard. At the ninth time of asking, they've, they've found a, a centre-back partnership in, in Johnny Evans and, and Raphael Varane that, that did the business mm. for them. So, yeah, I think to, to face 34 shots doesn't look good. But I think they can come away with some pride because they, they put their bodies on the line at key moments and they made some crucial blocks. What's the Daniel Story verdict? I, I, I just think Manchester United was so, so in, perceived as so much in crisis and rightly so before this game. that Everybody sort of tended to overlook that Liverpool have played pretty awfully in open play for the last few weeks. I saw them at Bramall Lane and they were, they were terrible until they scored from a set piece. Um, they beat Crystal Palace because Palace had a man sent off and then kind of weight of numbers got that done. But they've not been very good in open play. They've they've either been... They've, they've kind of been sort of Goldilocks and the Three Bears. They've been too slow in, in their own half and then they've been too rushed in the final third and never quite got it right. And Darwin Nunes sums up those final third issues exactly. He's a player who sometimes makes the right decisions, but it does feel like he's doing it by this sort of rapid-fire tossing of a coin in his head. Um, and if it lands up the right way, he'll do, you know, he'll make the right call. And if he doesn't, then he'll just, you know, he'll appeal for a penalty rather than trying to get the ball and score. Or he'll, rather than making a run, he'll just kind of walk into his own teammate. And that just feels like how they are in open play. There doesn't seem an obvious plan, which is very odd because that that is the one constant this season. You know, with Andrew Robertson out injured... Um, and the centre-backs having to change occasionally. They're different there. The midfield is completely new, but it's the same forward line as last season. So we kind of thought, OK, well, we're going to see the second season of this forward line coming together. And to my mind, that's the bit of the team that looks the least effective at the moment. There's no mm. polish still on Darwin Nunez, is there? I, I thought he looked really raw but exciting last season. He's still raw. He's still raw. I, I haven't seen a great deal of, of improvement in him. And I think that is a, is a slight problem for Liverpool because when a centre forward is a really important figure for, for obvious, obvious reasons, but they've also got to look after the ball and make good decisions. They often set the tone. And if that guy at the top end of the pitch is erratic, then I think a lot of the football can become that way too. So, yeah, that that is a problem, I think, for, for Jurgen Klopp. I worked on the Fulham game and they were really loose defensively in that one right. too and in, and in the second half after I hot footed it over here from, from Emirates Stadium Manchester United looked really threatening on that break they just lack that that confidence really to, to finish anything but I, I think Liverpool are yeah, at both ends of the pitch hmm. not at their best OK last Man United player to score at Anfield anybody know who that was? Jesse Lingard I think. yep five years ago well just on the subject of it being a nil-nil and only the fourth such result of the season. Anybody got a theory as to why we haven't had more goalless draws? I mean, the, the, I think the vague theory, uh, and it is just that, is that uh, the kind of accumulated fatigue of last season has meant that pressing uh, is not quite as intense. So teams are finding a way to create bigger chances. And, you know, it, it goes it goes without saying if you haven't had a nil-nil, but goals are up this season. Expected goals are up this season. I think teams are just a bit more open because they're probably a little bit more tired off the ball. Right, and there's Burnley in the league as well. So that's 
Yes, there are three worst teams than there were last season. Although Leeds and Leicester weren't, and Southampton were hardly brilliant at defending. Ma- right. Matches are quite a bit longer, aren't they, this season? I think we have mm, to take that into, uh, into account. And and almost every team in the division now wants to um, sort of roll the dice mm. inside their own penalty box and play out from the back, which never used to happen. Indeed. All right, well, next up for the Reds, they'll be hosting West Ham in the quarterfinals of the Carabao Cup on Wednesday and then Arsenal will be visiting Anfield in a big battle of the top two only one point between them that's next Saturday woof very shortly we'll discuss what happened to Arsenal in their clash with Brighton and the other Sunday two o'clock games stay with us you did stick around listener hooray because now we're going to talk about Arsenal's 2-0 win over Brighton Adrian was there we'll also hear from Jacob Tantor about what Villa got up to at Brentford and maybe find time for West Ham Wolves 3-0 3-0 to the Hammers. That was on the telly. Let's start, though, with the game they're calling the spiciest match of the season. Brentford Villa. Jacob Tanswell. Jacob, first of all, how many incidents were there and what caused all the trouble? To be fair, towards the end, there was too many to count. I think it all started with Ben Mee's uh, red card. Brentford felt very uh, unfortunate about it. And before that point, it was, it was an OK game. It was fairly average bog standing game in terms of there wasn't much incident between or controversy between the two teams but then Ben Mee's uh, red card seemed to you know, like the paper in a way um, in terms of their feeling a little bit of unjust and yeah it just continued from there I think it didn't have the Villa they didn't quite find their, their rhythm and they had to go to old fashioned tricks at some points to, uh, to get some to get the victory in the end but there was a few and that last 10 minutes uh, James was absolute carnage 1-0 mm. when Ben Nee left the field 1-0 that is to Brentford but it ended up a 2-1 Villa victory which leaves them just one point behind Arsenal at the top of the table level with Liverpool were Brentford the better side for much of the game then? Yeah they were in they were dominating really and just before Ben Mee got sent off uh, they really looked in, in cruise control they looked like Villa had run out of ideas uh, Brentford should have gone two up you know Risa had a header um, they had a one-on-one they were continually exploiting uh, Villa's offside trap um, they were playing direct they were turning Villa's centre-backs and yeah Villa looked leggy really they looked like a team that had played in Bosnia on a Thursday night and they've had issues away from home they've drawn at uh, Wolves, they lost to Forest, they drew at Bournemouth, uh, and it looked like it was going to follow the same way, really, in terms of performance. Uh, but luckily, for, for Villa, from Villa's perspective, um, that incident did change the game and, and gave them the initiative, really. OK, and their 25th Premier League win in 2023, which is their highest tally ever in a calendar year, follows on from the result midweek, as you say, away in Bosnia. What did they do? Was it 1-1? One well, one, yes, yeah, forgettable. <laughs> forgettable, but enough, yeah, but enough to take them through to the last sixteen of the Conference League directly. There we go. Instead of facing a playoff. Meanwhile, for Brentford, five defeats now in six. Jacob, have a great journey home, and we'll catch up with you soon. Thank you very much. Uh, let, let's just—I mean, those are scenes we all love to see. Mm. People, you know, players fracas, that kind of thing. So let's just take this a, a moment or two to savor. The Mope Martinez friction, the the Ollie Watkins scene as well. Danny, uh, what what? Sorry, I've just called you Danny. I'm not sure where that came from. But anyway, Daniel. Hey, Danny, <laughs> let's just stick with it. Daniel, I liked it. Daniel, there's been a bit of an update on one of the early kind of moments of tension there when Ollie Watkins stood in the goal and and essentially dr- addressed the supporters, his former supporters at Brentford. Yeah. Yeah, and, and and he he really likes Brentford, and Brentford really liked him until today. He 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 spoke with Thomas Frank after the game, which kind of gave it away that something had happened. It wasn't just his his sort of righteous anger, and it sounds like a, a fan or a few fans behind the goal were abusing his family during the second half. Um, so when he scored the goal, he just pointed to them, and you know, like t- loyalty in that sense is a two way street. You can't want players to, you know, to kind of do the decent thing and not celebrate against you if you're also going to have people in the crowd being idiotic and abusive towards them. So good on him for doing that. And and yeah, it sounds like he's spoken to Thomas Frank and said, look, this is what happened. I still like Brentford. I like you. We, we hear that him and Thomas Frank still text each other from time to time. So they're clearly matey. Um, but if someone's going to be a dick to you, then give it back. Quite right. Thank you, Danny. Uh, meanwhile, the other <laughs> the other scenes were, that were rather more comedy value there with the uh, um, Neil Mope and Emi Mo- Martinez having a bit of back and forth. Matt. 
Yeah, you you just got to love Emiliano Martinez, haven't you? He's absolute box office for for this kind of thing. And and Mope is underrated as well in in getting involved in in agro. But um, just to throw it back to Ollie Watkins, I'm I'm really pleased with this trend we've had this season of people not just celebrating, but celebrating with gusto against their old clubs. We had Nathan Ake the other week, didn't we, against Bournemouth, meaningless late goal, fine. Michael Keane this weekend at it as well. It's just... It's what football should be about, isn't it? And this was this was obviously very, very spicy. And we haven't even got to the Leon Bailey nearly scoring the most amazing own goal of all time. So there's lots to go at in this Tell game. us about that one. Uh, back pass that was a shot from the halfway line, which left his goalkeeper uh, scrambling and befuddled. And yeah, were DVDs still a thing, would have been added to the, uh, the Christmas blooper once in an instant. Good thing about the internet, I suppose. You can do that now. Yeah. Mope and Martinez. Who would have thought it? I, they are two of the most irritating what? Premier League players, aren't they? Are they? Yeah. Yeah, Mope really? goes under Neil the radar. Neil Mope, Mope he, is he really despised is. by Arsenal fans for, for a number of meetings where he's um, been just annoying. Oh. Just a little, can I, I say shit bag? Do yeah, we not have a, a sneaking bag. regard for Emmy Martinez and his kind of always elevated state of... No, I, I did until that World Cup oh, stuff. Dear. Okay. I just, you know, yeah. Let me move on then and ask Matt if he enjoyed, if it's players getting in uh, opposing fans' faces, did you enjoy uh, Paquetar and Kudos twice deciding to celebrate goals sat in front of the Wolves fans at the London Stadium? You see, I want to say yes to this, but I got so cross with Richarlison for doing it to the Forest fans that I would only be labelled a hypocrite. Right. But um, yeah, I do, I do broadly enjoy it, James. I do. I think it's part of, you know, it, it, you know, if I was commentating on the game, I would, I would get the opportunity to say, well, it is pantomime season after all, which is always one I like to dip into at this time of mm-hmm. year. Um, but it's what football's about, right? It's an entertainment industry. Uh, you should be able to wind people up, and and everybody gets really cross about it in the stadium, and then you leave and think, oh well, that was. Just a football match at the end of the day. Indeed so. Mm. West Ham, 3-0 winners over Wolves. The first two goals were both Paquetar to Kudus. Kudus a beautiful ball through from Paquetar. And then balls. he set up Bowen for the third as he well. He did yeah, a hat-trick of assists for, for Paquetar. I think he's, he's having a terrific season. No one in European football's big five leagues has made more through balls than Ooh. Lucas Paquetar this season, which is impressive. Very impressive. Not least because West Ham don't, have loads of the ball but maybe that's the reason why where they they can just spring those transitions things open up and yeah I mean a couple of these passes through to to Kudus were were exceptional and when you're talking about signings of the summer or Mm. best imports of of the season so far clearly you're thinking of Shobosly, Van der Ven, Doku but I I also think that Kudus comes into that category I think he's been Fantastic. Some moments yeah. of real class. When you when you look at him and Alvarez, who also came mm. from Ajax, and you wonder about some of the other Ajax signings that other <laughs> Premier League sides have, have made. Well, it does raise questions, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean that's that's you know, Marco Van Basten in true Van Basten fashion said it dead straight as it was. He said in February, I don't know why you'd sign Anthony when Mohamed Kudus was available because he's a better player, he's a stronger player, he's a more fun player for the fans to watch. Uh, and I think he's got a higher potential. And from everything we've seen, that looks right. But, you know, they weren't, Manchester United weren't the only club that rejected or didn't go for Mohamed Kudus. And he looks at it, I mean, as, as much as £38 million can look a steal, it absolutely does. Because like Paquetar, the reason it works, and it works under Moyes, is that their work off the ball and their strength in kind of protecting the ball is so good, as well as the, the flair stuff and the through balls and the passes. There's, um, we, we ought to praise West Ham because you look this time last year or including January and, and their signings were people like Danny Ings and Maxwell Cornet and Gianluca Scamacca and this season they seem to have had hit after hit with Ward Prowse as well as Alvarez and Kudus so there, there was all that um, discord at the start of the season wasn't there about was David Moyes signing the players or was it the new sporting director who probably weren't aligned in the same thinking well whoever it was who, who signed off on these players Every one of them looks like a decent buy at the moment. And and most of the West Ham fans of my acquaintance seem to love a whinge about David Moyes' sort of conservatism and, and approach, particularly to Premier League games. But you look at the difference of, of their results post-European games and, and Brighton, say, and, and how West Ham struggled to, to manage being in Europe and being in the Premier League last season compared to where they are 
in the table now you know they were flirting with relegation up until kind of april time last year and what are they seventh now so eighth because man united got the point but you know they're still they're way away from where they were last season and, and they won their europa league group at something of a canter so two no winners against freiburg on thursday to go straight into the last 16 of the europa league which means they don't have to do any european football till march as opposed to having the double playoff with a team dropping out of the Champions League that other the, the runners up will, will do. Brighton also through to the knockout stage of the Europa League after their late winner against Marseille on Thursday, but not so fortunate Sunday afternoon when they got well battered, you were saying, Adrian. The stats are extraordinary. First half shots. 15 nil to Arsenal. Yeah. Uh, I used those stats at half time on the show that I was working on. It's it was remarkable to see Brighton dominated so easily. I'm a big fan of Brighton. I think we probably all are here. They're they're a quality outfit that are normally incredibly difficult to play against. But this was like watching Arsenal against Burnley or Arsenal against Sheffield United. It was incessant pressure, 26 shots to six in the end. I I think that Arsenal produced an outstanding performance. I think this, this... must rank among their top two of the season so far. Performances, really? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Even as as impotent as Brighton were. Well, so because Arsenal made them that way? I, I I think so. I think it was a near perfect performance from from Mikel Arteta's point of view in terms of the control. So they controlled the game. That's we we know that he loves that. There was also lots of imagination, some really good improvised pieces of football. Um and, and clearly they, they shut out Brighton completely. They just had one effort on goal towards the end of the game at the, at the near post and that was it so I, I think it ticked a lot of boxes the, the only thing that was missing was the finishing and I think had had Arsenal brought their shooting boots this could have been four or five nil and, and no one really has looked like beating Brighton well Villa or five nil you were the yeah apart yeah, from they Villa did them, what, yeah six six was yeah it? that was yeah, yeah that, that is true that mm. is true and, and this this Brighton don't seem as strong certainly not defensively as they were last year but even so I, I just thought it was a very accomplished all-round performance from Arsenal um that that I think Mikel Arteta, it was almost the perfect Mikel Arteta performance mm. I, I would say okay first it, it comes back to the Brighton post Europe thing a bit doesn't it you know not to discredit Arsenal I'm sure they played really well in the game but you know Brighton after Europe drew at home to Sheffield United lost to 10 man Chelsea they played against 10 men for about 45 minutes they are clearly having an issue in in managing the two things I think just a word on a couple of individual performances. Oh, yeah. I think uh, Gabriel Jesus was he scored outstanding. Mm. Yeah, I mean he didn't give the ball away once, which I think is phenomenal for a centre forward because you play you play at striker. You're getting defenders all over you. They're trying to knock you over. He he executed every pass successfully, which I think is a, is, a, is a good achievement. He also produced some great moments of skill in the game. Um, so so a word for him and. And the others on Declan Rice and you know, the supporters that we were speaking to after the game were saying, look, we should probably just cough up some more money to West Ham for Declan Rice. He's, he's just becoming a he's joke, just, really. He's just he's just so good. It was it was as if... What was he doing that was so good? Eddie? Well, Brighton, as you know, love to play out from the back, don't they? Like to draw teams mm. in. And every time they played the ball into midfield, Declan Rice was on them basically intercepting the ball and then shrugging off players. It looked like he was, you know, two or three years old. It was like he was playing in a kid's game and he was two or three years older than the other kids in the Brighton engine room. He was that much stronger, that much quicker. He was anticipating everything. It was a really immaculate performance from Declan. Mm. What about Kai Havertz? Remember the days when he he couldn't (laughs) score? Four goals in seven now for him and Arsenal top of the league. I know, yeah, and they were singing his song, which is obviously what? a, oh, yeah? uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a it fun song. Oh, it's 60 million down the drain. Kai Havertz scores again. Na, 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 na. Eh, eh. Waka, waka, waka. Eh, eh. I think it, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a beauty of a song, but it was, it was a lovely little 1v1. Right. Um, and, he, and he finished with a plum, which was lovely. He did, although the keeper, question mark, etc. All right, next up. Let's talk about Brave Palace and their Brave 2-2 draw at Manchester City. City on Saturday, looking back to their best at home to Roy Hodgson's Crystal Palace. Goals from Jack Grealish and then Rico Lewis had them 2-0 up with a quarter of an hour to play. Every single City outfield player had created a chance and it was total dominance. And then it happened all over again, just like 
with Spurs, just like with Liverpool, just like with Arsenal, and just like even with Chelsea, City undone by late goals. Jean-Philippe Mateta pulled one back in the 76th minute. And then Phil, Phil Foden kicked out of Mateta in the box and there's a penalty and Michael Olise with nerves of steel converts. And that's now one win in six for City in the Premier League. Their worst start ever to a Premier League campaign under Guardiola. Well, first off, Adrian, you were commentating mm-hmm. on this game. First off, Palace happened. Oh, well played, well played Crystal Palace. They're just stuck in the game. They, they held their nerve. They are injury ravaged to, to an unbelievable degree. So much so that they basically picked nine defenders and the only two attacking players were Michael Elisa on the right wing and Jean-Philippe Mateta up front, both of whom were magnificent in the game because they didn't have very much of the ball. But every time Elise got it, he travelled with it. He took them up the field. Uh, and, and Mateta was, was a force of nature, really, in, in terms of just chasing down everything and hassling Manchester City defenders. And we saw that in the build-up to the, to the penalty that they got in, in injury time. So um, they defended brilliantly, you know, blocked everything, well, all, except the two goals that, that City scored, of course. But, but yeah, they, they, they held their nerve. They had to uh, put on a kid. Mm. Uh, David Ozo was only 18. Big, powerful central midfielder uh, who'd only played 14 minutes of Premier League football previously. And he came into this game and he was a towering presence. I've got to say, mm-hmm. he was excellent putting himself about. He looked after the ball beautifully as well. So well done to him. Well done to Palace. City, for City, it's a disaster of a result. Right. Absolute disaster. Well, so Palace scored with both their shots on target and you might feel that they were a bit fortunate with that. However, should they, should they not have been facing 10 men for most of the game? Edison's challenge on, remind me who he was taking out at Mateta. that time. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, there you go, on Mateta. Should that not have been sanctioned with the red? Yeah. No, Daniel? I don't, I, it, yeah, it was a kind of a classic sort of orangey challenge, I think. Um, Sim Binnable, say, exact, it? Well, it was exactly the same as... It, it was a, a completely different incident, but I thought about that exactly the same as I thought about Luke Shaw's uh, for, for United on, on Sunday, in that... Yes, it's it is that middle ground, and if it's a middle ground, I think you probably generally are on the side of yellow. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it was it's, again, it's one of those you want it for your team, and you argue it's a yellow when it goes against you, and that's the the golden rule. I mean, my takeaway on on City at the moment is I think the really interesting thing is I think they've I think they're paying again for not buying another striker because not just because Erling Haaland's out, but Julian Alvarez last season. I was, I was looking at this because I, I kind of thought Julian Alvarez must have played an awful lot of football. Is he just tired? And then he only started 13 league games last season. And basically, he was the most used substitute pretty much in Europe. He came on in 30 times, I think, for City in all competitions. He's one of only two players to start every game for City this season. And he just doesn't look as good starting games as he did coming off the bench and impacting them against tired defenders. And I think teams can just stay in the game against City a bit more. You know, I know, I know City, Palace actually have a really good record at the Etihad, but it feels like last year that sort of game would have been 3 or 4 nil, and then everybody, you know, if there is a late sloppiness, it's 4-1 rather than 2-2. And, you know, I know Guardiola thinks, you know, every time shot, every time someone has a shot against us, it goes in, and that there is an, definitely an extent of that. But I think there are little things that just aren't working the same way, and it's not necessarily as simple as... We conceded goals. We're not develop. We're not defending very well. I think it starts much higher at the pitch. Um, Manchester City in need of a reliable goal scorer, maybe um, from good stock. I mean, it's it's strange to to dip into the academy if you if you're Manchester City, I guess. But you know, if you've got Emil Heskey's son Jaden playing for your under twenty ones, you know, maybe you get that bit of footballing legacy and see how it works. Very nice, mm. very nice. Pep was talking about it being. Did he blame carelessness afterwards? And I'm not sure, does this feed into the same kind of, well, for Liverpool, it was a quadruple they were chasing, but the post-treble fatigue, whether physical or or maybe mental, of a a group of players who've been right to the end, of, of, of gone deep in multiple competitions the season before. And if it is that, sorry to extend this question still further, (laughs) but why is it that Pep doesn't make substitutions earlier in games? Does he just not trust his bench? Hmm. That might be a factor. I think. I think what he was talking about here specifically was giving away silly penalties, which was exactly what they did at Chelsea, wasn't it? And I think that you know that's kind of 
do it once, okay, fine, but do it in a second game. You could see why that would be really frustrating for a manager. Um, but it did give us that magnificent shot, didn't it, of um, of Roy Hodgson, <laughs> who's been been threatening a full heel turn in recent weeks with his grumpiness, but looking all avuncular and slightly ornithological at, at Pep Guardiola across the the dugout and and making everything seem right it's in the world. But yeah, I think I think it's yeah. It's but it, again, it comes back to fatigue, doesn't it? And you're probably right, James. You probably should make substitutions earlier in the game because tired players make bad decisions. Mm. And that's what Foden did. I think Ilkay Gundogan is you're seeing his absence felt as well because in games where City weren't really doing a great deal, he just had that habit, didn't he, of popping up and and delivering in key moments. The two players that he kind of brought in to replace them were both on the bench in this game: Kovacic and Mateus Nunez. Neither was called upon in the game, which I find interesting. You know, as he lost trust. In those guys, does he not believe that they can come on and 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 deliver for him? I don't know, All right. but, but I think that Gundogan is isn't that they're feeling that absence big time. And yes, City fans, uh, you're also without Kevin De Bruyne. Oh yeah, and uh, Erling Haaland in this game, and John Stones with all the multiple. Uh, Values, oh, sorry, all the multiple qualities that he brings to to City's play. Off they go then to the Club World Cup. By the time they return, how many points could they be behind? Twelve. Ten now. Ten. Yeah. Let's be ten now. Yeah. Ten points behind Arsenal. They won't be playing in the Premier League until the twenty seventh of December, Man City, because of their activities in Saudi Arabia on Tuesday, six p.m. UK time. They'll be. Facing the semi-final against the Japanese Urawa Red Diamond, who were 1-0 winners against Mexican side Lyon in their quarter-final. Dan Orlovitz, who's been on this show before, describes them as brutally efficient in defence but lacklustre in attack. So, yeah, could be an interesting match on Tuesday. The other semi-final, we'll see Fluminense, the South American champions, up against Al Ali, who knocked out Karim Benzema's Al Itihad in the quarter-final. Alex, Alex Schalk, who scored uh, the winner for Urara uh, Red Diamonds uh, against Lyon. Um, his last two clubs were Servette in Switzerland and Ross County in Scotland. Wow. That is a heck of a weird career to go on. Good for him. We can see how this goes, though, doesn't it? As, as I sort of alluded to, because we've got this Liverpool-Arsenal game coming up. City go away, get some sun on their backs, win the Club World Cup, come back, find out that their rivals have taken points off each other and then they go into the second half of the season do what they do and walk away with the title again. Are they going to do it again, though, Matt? Mm, depends how long Haaland's out for us, I suppose, but I'm not sure I trust Liverpool or Arsenal to, to maintain their current form. OK. All right. Duly noted. Next up, let's check out the other games which took place this weekend in the Premier League. Full-time Europe, the Athletics Women's Football Podcast will be out on Tuesday. They'll probably be talking about Spurs' victory 1-0 over Arsenal Saturday lunchtime. What a what a Spurs goal that was. Yeah, the new um the copy of Ange Ball. This is the claim from from Tottenham's coach who the the improvement over the last few months has been extraordinary. No, I mean nobody saw this coming and Arsenal who I mean they beat Chelsea last weekend and then I mean that just it just smacks of ultimate complacency. Um but yeah, a huge result for Spurs who are you know they see themselves as uh, the athletic did a piece this week actually kind of behind the scenes with them where they really do want to be another force in women's football you know they're doing this properly they're not just you know they're they're, they're walking the walk as well as talking the talk and um that's a, a obviously a statement win there were two actually two statement wins this weekend because liverpool also beat manchester united on sunday before the the men's game uh, and they are another team who have come an awful long way under matt beard in a pretty short space of time all right matt you were doing the chelsea game sunday yeah, I was. Um, I sort of wonder, by the way, if Matt Beard might be a contender to replace Emma Hayes. He's a former um, Chelsea manager, so there would be some logic to that. But yeah, huge for Chelsea. You look really, really sort of weary against Hecken in the Champions League in midweek and, and struggled to create good quality chances. And, and probably a trip to Bristol City, with the, the bottom team in the league, with, was good for what ails them. And um, they scored some excellent goals, Lauren James in particular, uh, sensational, really nice Aaron Cuthbert volley as well. And as soon as it's 2 0 at half time, you think they're going to uh, go on and, and win it pretty comfortably, which they did. And they got Micah Hamano on for her debut in the second half, which gives um, Chelsea another option in those kind of wide forward areas, which is pretty scary 
for the rest of the league. But yeah, you know, a week ago we're talking about Chelsea getting absolutely humiliated in front of a record crowd at the Emirates and losing 4-1. And here we are going into the winter break. They don't play in the league again until the third week of January and they're three points clear at the top of the table, which is which is very Emma Hayes Chelsea-like. Remarkable. All right, well, you can hear more in full-time Europe. Uh, the Totally Football Show's European edition will also be out on Tuesday. No doubt discussing... Sevilla bidding off yet another manager. Diego Alonso's got fired. He had 12 games in La Liga and Champions League, won none of them. They're now looking for their fifth permanent manager since the start of last season, are Sevilla. We'll also take in the Champions League last 16 draw, which will be happening on Monday. Anyway, tune in on Tuesday to the Totally Football Show's European edition. Well done to Rangers, who won the Scottish League Cup final on Sunday. 1-0 over Aberdeen. Uh, Rangers also... Speaking of things in Seville, they became the first team, uh, the first visiting side this season to win a game at Real Betis when they defeated uh, Manuel Pellegrini's side 3-2 to go through to the last 16 of the Europa League. Last Scottish side in Europe doing their bit for the coefficient. Lovely stuff. Uh, League Cup in England as well. That's coming up this midweek. Are you excited by the quarterfinals? Shall I just run them by you? Liverpool taking on West Ham on Wednesday. Port Vale Borough. It's another one. I'm there. Are you going? I Port am vale there. Borough. So don't, yeah, don't I'm not it. mocking I'm it. Danny's a hipster, isn't he? Chelsea's at home to Newcastle and Everton play Fulham. I was going to start with Everton, but let's hear about Port Vale Borough. Why, Daniel? Why? Uh, I think it's a really cool game because it's a semi-final to get into a semi-final domestic cup competition. I know Middlesbrough are no secret that they've been a really good cup cup team down the years but i think port vale can do it They're, they've it's you know it's a pretty incredible story if they get to a semi-final of a, of a efi cup particularly given over the last four five six years maybe even a decade that competition has become dominated by premier league big premier league teams starting to pick stronger teams in the quarterfinals onwards so the draw has obviously helped but yeah it just feels like a really good shootout to get into a semi-final excellent the other games full of Premier League-ness. Uh, Everton playing Fulham. Everton who just got their fourth straight win. This one was away at Turf Moor, a return there for Sean Dyche and a couple of Everton players as well. It's the first time in 21 years that the Toffees have gone four league wins in a row without conceding a single goal. They are now a point better off than they were at this stage last season, even with that 10-point deduction. Wow. Impressive. Yeah, really impressive. I think that he's building something there. What made their victory at Burnley stand out for me was that he had so many players out. He's had this 4-4-1-1 formation that was working beautifully, but three of his back four were missing. So he, he revamped it to kind of a 3-5-1-1 and, and they were just as good, if not better. I, I do think the two wingers have been great. Um Harrison and McNeil, I think they make a real real difference. Calvert-Lewin being fit helps, we know that. But yeah, they, they've become a pretty fit, powerful, strong team. Yeah, they, they are doing the, the Sean Dyche basics very well. It's the first time Everton have won four Premier League games in a row without conceding since 2002, David Moyes' first full season. So these are <laughs> record-equaling runs by a manager who... At times last season, just looked like it wasn't he wasn't quite able to to turn it into his team. Dominic Calvert Lewin being fit helps. The wingers are, you, you know, Adrian's right, absolutely brilliant. But it's players like you know you heard James Tarkovsky talk after the game, and I know he knows Dyche and Burnley, but he's talking like he's enjoying his football more than he ever has in his career. Uh, Seamus Coleman, you know, they all they all say he's leading the team like nobody from the dressing room. One of the like best humans, isn't he? According to Frank Lampard. <laughs> I'd love to see his top 100. That's that's the Frank Lampard who throws out Abdoulaye Decoré, who now seems to score in pretty much every game for Everton. I think that, that man management side of Deitch is something that's probably quite underrated just because of his demeanour. You, you, he's kind of pigeonholed as a not a ranter and a raver, but a, you know, kind of basics, let's do the bleep test and run as hard as we can, lads. But I think actually his man management skills are... Yeah, yeah, quite, which was uh, not true, was it? Um, but yeah, having, having seen them... You know, live last week, 
really impressed by the way he organised them, and particularly in this game, because Mikolenko pulled out late, didn't he? And, he? and he said in his post-match, well, what we did is we didn't have a session to work on the new formation, so we showed him that good clips of them doing it well in a game that we played earlier in the season and didn't kind of focus on the negatives, but said, look, you've done this before, you can do it again. And lo and behold, they kept their fourth clean sheet in succession and you know I said this before they've got because it's Fulham at home in the League Cup quarter final and yeah Fulham have been better of late but playing at Goodison is difficult well quite yeah yeah and and it could be a glorious season for, for Everton you know we might even get a Merseyside Derby League Cup final which would be something pretty spectacular unless it's Port Vale of course yeah <laughs> uh, Jimenez who uh, was sent off after just 23 minutes of Fulham's clash this weekend in the Premier League away at St. James's. They were beaten 3-0 by Newcastle. Uh, it was a bit a spectacular challenge or the Newcastle performance? Yep. Both? No, I don't, I don't care about the performance. The The challenge was, yeah, I think the weirdest red card I've seen, it was kind of, it was both simultaneously incredibly weird and yet also when you watch it in slow-mo, you can see every one of Raul Jimenez's thoughts as he's going because he kind of flies into it and he's lost his head and then he realises a second too late that he needs to bring his foot down at which point he's just careering in the air um and yeah i mean he, his his anus hits sean longstaff's face there's no other way to describe it he really it. takes his um, head off doesn't it i mean yeah i mean uh, i have to say i was impressed by marco silva mo- moaning about the referee after the game that was like that was kind of peak premier league 2023 for me because yeah if the rule is reckless then um I think flying through the air, unable to stop into someone's face with any part of your body yeah, is probably right. Especially the anus. Um, first senior... <laughs> especially the anus. Raul Jimenez. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> first senior goal for 17-year-old Lewis Miley as well, who's uh, uh, very much filed among the good news for Newcastle, who with that remain in and around the battle for top four, or is it five? We'll have to see. We'll have to see. Yes, yeah, Arsenal mm. City are under pressure, aren't they, to, to deliver in the Champions League? They've got two more players out, haven't they, Newcastle? Mm. Uh, Cher came off and, and Joel Linton. So they're pretty depleted for that, that cup game at Chelsea. Is, is that, because it is extraordinary how much Newcastle have been hit mm. by injuries, is it because of this business? Is it because of that or is it the other way around, cause and effect, that um, Eddie Howe was using the same 10 yeah. outfield players for... 63 games in a row. I think that is a big factor, yeah. yeah. I, I just think they've, they've had to play 90 after 90 after 90 and and, and it's catching up with them. You know, a lot of these are, are muscle injuries, aren't they? So mm. they've just got to get on with it, Newcastle United. But this was this was a big win. I, I thought Phil, Fulham had potential to go there and get, get a result. They started the game quite well, Fulham. But, but the outcome of this match... Hinge totally on the, on the Jimenez tackle. Okay, next up for Newcastle, as mentioned, the quarterfinal with Chelsea, who themselves were 2 0 winners uh, against Sheffield United. Matt, you were there at this game. I was, yeah, yeah. And I, I wondered if we'd even talk about it at all after the first half mm. because it, it was such a non event. But um, it ended up being pretty significant for Chelsea I think I think it's one of those where you know the automatic response is to say well you beat the team who are bottom of the league at home there's not much you can take from that but it's a critical week in Chelsea's season with this League Cup quarter final, which is you know by far the biggest game that they will have played so far so they absolutely had to go into it with some positivity but but also I think it was reassuring to see Maurizio Pochettino make a tactical change at all but but one which impacted the game and ended up winning it for them because he's been so rigidly stuck to the formation and as much as he can be with their injury problems the personnel that that to see you know it's quite a simple thing I suppose to put Cole Palmer from from the 10 roll out wide and, and swap Sterling round and and they were both involved in in both of the goals having having looked in the first half as if nobody was going to score in the match so I think that maybe gives a bit more Chelsea fans are still very much on the on the fence about Pochettino particularly those who get crossed with the fact that he's seemingly got no interest in playing anybody from the academy when you look at Lewis Miley for example and what he's come in and done for for Newcastle but um, this was important for Pochettino I think to show that he can still affect games himself um, during them And, and yeah Cole Palmer I mean it was said Danny Murphy said it on Match of the Day, didn't he? But it's extraordinary for a 21-year-old who'd, who'd barely started a Premier League match before he came to Chelsea to be 
the most important player in the mm. team. You know, Conor Gallagher might make an argument that, that he could lay claim to that too. But Palmer is just absolutely pivotal to the way that Chelsea play at the moment. And he's the only one of the forward players who is playing as if he's brimming with confidence. He wants the ball all the time. And every time he gets it, there's a buzz of anticipation that something's going to happen. And more often than not, it does. And, and he was the difference maker in this match. He was absolutely superb. All right. Chelsea fans on the fence. Uh, Christopher Nkunku on the bench meantime Matt I noticed that you've already made a song for him <laughs> yeah I have the, en the, the end of it needs work if I'm honest and, and maybe we'll workshop that well, how does on, it go uh, straight out of Cobham tomorrow uh, so I, I feel it's got to be to the tune of Agadoo because okay. of Nkunku so there's your Agadoo in the background take it away Matt we're working um, we're working with that just give me a second while I get it up here we go Unku coo 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 had a problem with his knee. Unku coo 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 delayed his debut for Chelsea. To the left, to the right, blowing up balloons all night. He is class latching onto a pass, and we're thrilled to see him on the grass. Whoa, 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 whoa. Perfect. Well, I'll stop you there. <laughs> yeah, I should just say that um, Cole Palmer's got a, a much better song than that, which the Chelsea fans have, have come up with, which which gives a nod to everything that's happened at the club over the last year, which I think is um, it's nice to see. Uh, from the Chelsea supporters. It's to the tune of uh, Ring of Fire, and it goes, Running from the left to right, da -da 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 -da. Cole Palmer is dynamite, da -da 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 -da. sign him up for eight more years, da -da 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 -da. <laughs> Chelsea boys are on the beers. Da -da 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 -da. So well done to whoever came up with that one. It's better than my unkunku one, but I was yeah. under pressure. And yeah, straight out of Cobham tomorrow, the Chelsea FC podcast from The Athletic. If you've got a better one, do let us know, at SO Cobham Pod on... X. Yeah, Daniel. Anything you any, want to add to any that? Any songs, Danny? Well, Matt. Matt. Matt kind of expressed his disdain at Adrian singing a chant that he'd nicked that they'd nicked from Forest, mm. and that and Kunku chant is nicked from Newcastle when they used to have Jose Lu. Uh, they used to sing Jose Lu Lu Lu. Might score one. He might score two. Which <laughs> yeah. you could probably put that line in as well if you want. Matt. <laughs> you want to steal it all? All right. Uh, yeah. You know, That's it's decent. a collaborative thing. More than happy to accept. The Cole Palmer one is good. I don't like to praise Chelsea fans, but the Cole Palmer one is good. What were they singing on Friday night at the City Ground, Daniel? Uh, so, well, it's been really interesting hearing the Steve Cooper chant uh, over the last few weeks because it always used to be the kind of overwhelming support. You know, he's he's going to get sacked, so we'll see. The fans will sing. Oh, I don't want to say we. He's going to get sacked, so the fans will sing his name to say we don't want him sacked. How does that it song does go, definitely... Daniel? Just give us a rendition. A couple, aren't there? I won't be singing. I won't be singing it. Um, but yeah, over the, over the last few weeks at Fulham and Wolves and on Friday night, there's a definite tinge of thanks and farewell mm. and we're sorry you're leaving, but this feels like you're going to be losing your job oh. soon. Feel to that. Forest were, I think, the better team for large large parts of Friday evening, but they have a problem in that um, one bit of quality well there's there's two distinct problems one is that they make mistakes that generally lead to goals um, Matt Turner did that for the second when Forrest were on top and secondly that the, they, they've they actually got the same problem as Sheffield United this season which is the the counter pressing really gets them so when they they choose a sacrifice possession and then when you win the ball back you have to be able to protect it and do something with it because if you can't then keep the ball for more than five seconds you're suddenly inviting pressure and you're under pressure for extended periods of time and they haven't been good enough to to kind of thwart that pressure mm. they're not as bad as Sheffield United at it but they are not good as soon as they win the ball mm. back they are swarmed and they struggle to play more than three passes one win in 13 now for Forrest Spurs meanwhile uh, with a, a handy victory to keep themselves on the fringes of however many Champions League places the Premier League receives for next season. They will be facing their next game, which is with Everton, as it happens, next Saturday, without Yves Bissoumo, who's got sent off for the second time this season. Mm. Oh, and they're going to be without him for AFCON as well in January. So, yeah. Anyway, that is the state of play after 17 match days of this Premier League. Matt, anything else you want to add? <laughs> you know what, James? There is, um, and and you'll you'll forgive me for this because it's very very niche. But um, I did a game on Saturday morning between Chelsea's under 18s and West Brom's under 18s. It finished nine one to Chelsea. 
And I want to just give a little mention, a little shout out. I'm sure he doesn't listen. He's a 17 year old Ivorian called Czech Kone, who scored what is comfortably the best goal I've seen all weekend. He picked the ball up about halfway inside his own half, beats a couple of players, absolutely larrups one into the bottom corner of the net. A wonderful goal. Unfortunately for him, the score was 8 0 against his team at the time. <laughs> so this poor lad turns around. There's none of his teammates anywhere near him. He knows he can't celebrate the goal. Who knows? whether he goes on to have a career in football or not this might be as good as it gets for Chet Kone scoring this absolute wonder goal and the disappointment on his face just made me so sad because he knew as we all knew that it meant absolutely nothing and none of his teammates would even shake him by the hand or pat him on the back and I just felt so sorry for poor young Chet Kone it finished 9-1 Chelsea was so affronted by that they went up and scored straight away um, yeah, but I, I I feel your pain, Chet Kone, and I enjoyed your goal. So <laughs> you, you you just keep plugging away and we'll see what happens. Look that out on YouTube. Uh, I'm going to enjoy that straight after we wrap this pod, which we're pretty much at the point of doing. Daniel, many thanks. Look forward to reading your verdict in The Score in The Eye on Monday morning. Matt, uh, back with not only straight out of Coven, but also what the EFL with Adrian, perhaps. Is that right? Adrian, you joining yeah, Matt? Be there. Yeah? yeah, excellent. All right, good. And you as well, Adrian, thank you for coming in with your My knitwear pleasure. and your knowledge. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Many thanks to Liam and Charlie in the booth. And you, listener, we're back th- Tuesday morning with the Euro crew. Do join us for that. For now, from all of us here, it's goodbye. The Totally Football Show podcast is available three times a week, bringing you all the football news you could reasonably be expected to care about. We've got views we've got stats we've got analysis we've got some of the best football writers around and the whole thing is absolutely free so have a listen on spotify or apple podcasts or all the usual places by clicking on the link below